Yes, I'm. I'm, I'm already thinking about comparing uh, <coughs> temperate Europe with the with the Aegean or, or with the classical world. Though I do touch on that um, um, towards the end. I'm really more thinking about the parallels or the comparisons <coughs> between approaches between and within temperate Europe itself, particularly Britain um, and Central Europe, which. I believe the approaches, at least, or the frameworks of interpretation have got much more further apart um, in uh, the last few uh, decades. I'm really interested in hill forts, um, particularly British hill forts, but I mean, it's more and more thinking about hill forts as a kind of a broader European um, phenomenon. And actually thinking critically about that, I mean, are they actually, this is a term we give to these sites, um, across uh, sites that, that seem to have some kind of similarity across Europe. Um, but really, are they a kind of an entity that we can talk about in those terms, or are they perhaps uh, more of a regional expression um, of, uh, of, of identity or some kind of um, um, social solutions to, to issues? So essentially, what I'm interested in exploring today really is, is is, is hill fort, is, are hill forts, are there, morph, are there morphological similarities simply, is it simply superficial? Is it a, or is it actually a consequence um, of regional needs? Or do they represent a shared kind of vocabulary of power right across Europe? Or perhaps are they simply a common response to, to similar social um, problems? Now I want to explore this by comparing two of the, uh, the most well-known hill forts in Europe, that of Danebury in Wessex and the Hoyneberg uh, in Baden-Württemberg in, in southern Germany. Now, they occupy almost entirely unconnected regions um, of Europe and are apparently a form of kind of a material representation, I suppose, of two very different um, Iron Age societies. However... They have several factors which make them kind of ideal case studies um, for this kind of analysis. Both hills, or the hilltop plateaus, are of, of relative um, modest size, but both have been subject to very extensive um, excavations, which means that we can confidently talk and analyse the spatial and chronological um, patterns. And of course, both sites have formed the basis of social models um, for the Iron Age in their um, respective countries. Now, I'm initially going to outline uh, the uh, structural sequences um, for both the sites and, and highlight what I think are some of the um, rather remarkable synergies. Now, the intention here isn't to argue that these synergies are the result of direct cultural contact or exchange but merely to rethink the significance um, of some of those um, similarities. <coughs> so if we think about Danebury first, I'm sure a familiar site to, to many of you. Danebury, um, in, uh, located within central um, Hampshire in, uh, in the area that we call Wessex, surrounded by uh, Middle Bronze Age uh, field systems and set within this kind of large area of dry chalk and downland. Now almost 60% of the interior um, has been um, excavated and that's revealed 22 different structural um, periods spanning uh, the period from the late Bronze Age through to um, the late Iron Age. And combine that with aerial survey but also uh, Barry Cunliffe's Damien Byron's programme, we really have an unparalleled understanding of the development of this hill fort and of its um, surrounding landscape. If we run through the sequence of occupation at the site, well really the first construction of a boundary was in the late Bronze Age. This is known as the uh, outer earthwork and encloses about um, 16 uh, hectares, but it was really quite ephemeral, and within the interior there's very little evidence um, for any occupation. However, dispersed throughout the landscape surrounding um, these, this uh, hilltop enclosure were a range of smaller enclosed and unenclosed 
um, farmsteads. And this kind of arrangement could perhaps indicate that we have a, a largely dispersed population, but a population that was probably somewhat heterarchically organised. That is to say, the household as the major social unit. Early in the 5th century is when the hill fort itself um, was first um, established, and that's characterised by the construction of a timber box rampart located wholly within uh, the confines of that um, outer earthwork. We also, at this time, had the first clear evidence for occupation um, activity. That occupation um, itself is characterised by clusters of roundhouses and other kinds of storage buildings which are sort of, sort of loosely scattered around the interior um, of the hill fort. Each cluster then presumably represents an individual or extended household which had moved into the hill fort after its um, construction. The 4th and early 3rd centuries, periods uh, 3 to 5, characterised by an almost obsessive interest um, with the boundaries, with the construction of the boundaries. The gateways were uh, themselves remodelled several times. The outer earthwork was made uh, more substantial. The middle rampart encircling the southern half of the hill fort um, was constructed. And the inner earthwork itself was massively heightened and aggrandised. Um, the timber box was replaced um, by a glacis-style rampart, which, when freshly dug, um, would have um, sparkled white um, with the chalk that had been um, exposed. Periods 6, 1 to, to 7 marked an increase in the intensity of occupation within the hill fort and a corresponding decrease in the, in the uh, construction uh, or the interest in the construction of the boundaries. And the most dramatic change occurred during periods 6, 4 to 6, 6. Here we have evidence of very intensive, of, of a very intensive occupation with a large number of roundhouses, similarly sized roundhouses, predominantly with southeastern um, facing entrances, packed into neat rows um, just inside the, the lee of the ramparts. This arrangement may then have lasted for several decades before the, the rows of, of houses were replaced by, lo again, loose scatters of two or three buildings, possibly because people were actually moving out, so the population was moving out of the hill fort. The Iron Age occupation of Danby ended around the middle of the first century BC, quite likely, suddenly and violently. Here's a, a nice image of a, of a potential attack on the... Uh, the Eastern Gateway. The Eastern Gateway itself was destroyed by fire. The remaining houses inside seem to have all been burnt at this time as well. Now, the excavator Barry Cunliffe interpreted the hill fort as a high status settlement of a king and his retinue, and he saw that it, that it performed a range of central place functions, particularly um, production and storage. Now, that model or that interpretation was attacked almost immediately by John Collis particular, who disagreed fundamentally with the idea of a hierarchical social structure, and also J.D. Hill and others who demonstrated conclusively that production at Danger is no greater than at non-Hillfort um, sites. So this then leaves a question about how we should understand Danger. British hill forts are seldom considered to be urban settlements, but it should be highlighted that hill forts like Danger represent a significant shift away from any type of previous settlement organisation in terms of scale and also intensity of occupation. Essentially, they represent new ways of living together that required new ways of mediating social fissions. Oh dear, I'm running a little late. Um, what about the Heuneberg then? Well, the Heuneberg uh, in southern Germany uh, again, a relatively unprepossessing hilltop plateau uh, situated on a, on a stretch of the upper Danube. Here we also have a large number of structural periods, 23 identified, um, dating from the Neolithic to the Middle Ages. 
Um, and that can be related to activity in the immediate environs, including the so-called lower town, this area, and also the outer um, settlement, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. Now I'm going to concentrate on periods 4C to 1A, which relate to um, the later prehistoric period. Now, the hilltop itself was enclosed and occupied in the Middle Bronze Age, but abandoned by about 1100. By 800, there was an increasing number of individual farmsteads emerging in the landscape surrounding the hilltop, suggesting perhaps a kind of relatively heterarchically organised society at the time, again focused on the household unit. In the late 7th century, the hilltop plateau there was reoccupied, period um, 4C. A box-built timber wall was constructed, and within the enclosure, several clusters of buildings were scattered around the interior. These appear to represent the agglomeration of previously independent rural settlement groupings into a single political entity. Around 600, the boundaries were entirely remodelled, internal occupation restructured. A wall was made of mud, bri mud bricks with projecting bastions, um, very unusual um, in temperate Europe, but uh, parallel perhaps in the, in the Mediterranean world. Um, the enclosed area, the buildings of the previous phase were demolished, and rows of similarly sized structures um, were, along streets were established. Immediately outside the hilltop plateau, the earthen timber boundaries of the lower town were constructed, as well as an elaborate gatehouse. And surrounding the plateau and the lower town was a, an outer settlement stretching over 100 hectares. Uh, this thing, this uh, essentially was characterised by a number of farmsteads which seemed to be regularly organised, again, into um, rows, rectangular, enclosed rectangular um, farmsteads. The mud brick wall um, was destroyed along with the outer settlement in a catastrophic fire um, around 540 BC. The boundary was rebuilt but using traditional um, methods of earth and timber boxes. The Iron Age occupation at the, uh, the Hoynebeg is thought to have ended um, around um, 450, or oh, sorry, I should say at this time as well, the interior occupation is somewhat different. Uh, the, it's less rigidly structured, and there are some very large buildings constructed, the so-called Herrenhauser, um, within the, uh, within the uh, interior on the plateau. The, Occupation appears to end around about 450, again in a, in a kind of catastrophic fire. Now, the most influential interpretation of the Heunerberg was offered by Kimmig, who established a kind of a model of social and political organisation analogous to feudal society. And so within this model, the Heunerberg as a residence of a prince and his retinue, power was obtained from the control and redistribution of prestige items, particularly those in the Mediterranean, um, while the Episodes of boundary destruction have been interpreted as kind of dynastic um, takeovers. Now, when we start looking at the structural assemblages from both sides, I think we can come up with a range of quite compelling similarities. There seems to be a shared interest in the monumentality of the boundaries of these sites. There also seems to be low density dispersed settlement, particularly during the early phases, which seem to be deliberately changed to an organised internal layout. Then we see variation with later occupation trajectories at both the sites, um, somewhat uh, different characteristics. So we think about each one of these uh, briefly in turn there. We think firstly about the boundaries. Now, features like the, the Hoynerberg's mud brick wall or Danbury's glacis rampart would have been visually stunning and involved an extravagant use of resources. The interpretation of these boundaries has tended to see them as a result of elite control and display. But in recent years, there's been a growing emphasis on Britain placed upon the social implications of participation in boundary construction events. Neil, in particular, has interpreted construction events as key arenas for the negotiation of social relationships. So essentially, labour is given as a gift to pay social debts, and the boundaries remain as a kind of representation of those relationships. The enormous multiple boundaries at Danbury then were under almost constant construction for a considerable period of time. 
Now, given the site was unlikely to be a centre for production and exchange, this interest in boundaries should be interpreted as a result of the competitive exchange of labour between the surrounding communities and the occupants. In these societies, giving labour was the social glue that held communities together. Clearly, at the Hoynerberg, social competition encompassed the acquisition and consumption of material as well as boundary construction, which at that site appears rather episodic. Could construction events in this society then have acted to initiate social relationships, which were then subsequently maintained through the regular gift exchange of material? Give me two minutes extra, James. That's fine. <laughs> That's perfect, I'll take five. <laughs> period 4B at the Hewn at Hoyneberg and period 6, six at the Danbury marked a significant or deliberate reorganisation of the previous residential pattern. Mm. Oh, sorry. No. So, if the one says that the boundaries are a physical manifestation of the relationship between the occupants and surrounding communities, then the architecture and layout of the interior was an expression of the relationship between the occupants themselves. So it's interesting to note that after the construction of the original Hillfort boundaries, Occupation within the interior of both hill forts was characterised by small populations living in clusters of buildings scattered around the interior. The groups of buildings presumably represent households who had moved into the hill forts. The residential layout suggests a similar attempt to maintain a rural, heterarchically organised society in a more centralised social form. Period 4b and period 6.6 6 of Danbury then marks a significant reorganisation of that pattern. Buildings during these phases were practically identical, arranged into rows, and is suggestive of significant planning. At Danbury, I've argued before that this spatial arrangement was a strategy to blur the distinctions between households and strengthen the importance of the communities. Can we envisage a similar scenario then at the Hoynerberg, in which the residential pattern appears to be a conscious attempt to reduce obvious status distinctions between the residents and increase the sense of communal solidarity? The obvious question then is why? I've already argued that both hill forts represent a significant shift away from any type of previous settlement organisation. So are we seeing similar experiments to manage the social pressures exacerbated by large populations living in close proximity. That these developments aren't linear is evidence from the subsequent uh, evidence from these sites which seems to be quite different. Very briefly then, I've chosen to explore these issues through these two particular hill forts, but I suppose the obvious question is, are these patterns part of a, a wider or broader phenomenon in later prehistoric Europe? I'd like to finish then by broadening the debate to include the classical world. Now the subordination of the individual household to an overall gridded plan is the guiding principle of the classical polis. But increasingly, this is, seeing, this is being recognised as misleading. Not all early polis were gridded settlements. Eritrea, for instance, appears to have begun as little more than agglomerations of independent households, which only later was subsumed within an overall community plan echoing, perhaps, the spatial arrangements at Danbury and the Hoynerberg. So, to sum up then, these two case studies have demonstrated, I think, that even in very different Iron Age societies, similar social problems and issues may have manifested similar responses. The broad movement to architectural conformity and organisation rigidity within both hill forts suggests similar ways of dealing with tensions of transforming rural, heterarchically organised societies into more centralised forms. Sorry for running over. Thank you.